Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Amen. Well, this morning we want to share with you about having a relationship with Christ. This passage and numerous others speaks to us and encourages us to have a relationship with Christ. And I've said it numerous times, and if God gives me grace, I'll say it numerous other times. It's one thing to have a religion. It's quite another to have a personal relationship with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we look for the reason for it and the joy that it brings. The first thing has to do with being ashamed. In verse 11 it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And we really need to bear down on this matter of being ashamed. You know, I started to run a reference, but it got a little bit more than I could handle. And about the matter of being ashamed and how many times that it's mentioned in the Word of God. Jesus says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Luke 9, 26. It's important to the Lord Jesus Christ that we be not ashamed of him. Now, how do we do that? I mean, how do we be ashamed of the Lord, especially if we're believers? I mean, that he's died on the cross for us. He's overcome Seth, sin, hell, and the grave, and he arose victorious. How is it that we could be ashamed of him, and how would that be manifested? Well, sometimes it's at the lunch table, and we're out and about in a restaurant or a cafe, and we know we ought to pray, and uh, maybe we're kind of like a, a secret disciple, and we kind of do one of these, and then we go ahead and eat, or Maybe we wait for some little kid across the restaurant to holler out, aren't we going to pray? And it spreads throughout the auditorium. But there's a lot of ways. Some people can be talking contrary to the word of God, and we just kind of sit back and we don't want to say anything because we don't want to appear to be self-righteous. Or we don't want to be a holy Joe. And so we just refrain from saying anything and we wind up being ashamed of the Lord. Well, Paul saw the importance, the importance of this early. And in Romans chapter 1, he addresses it. And he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the word of God. And we ought not be ashamed of the word of God. Now, he that sanctifieth. Now, this refers to the Lord Jesus who puts us on the road to sanctification through justification. In other words, when we're <coughs> saved by grace through faith plus nothing, then the Lord puts us on this road of sanctification, separating us unto the Lord, that we'd be different from the world. We'd not be conformed to this world, but we'd be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I see it as a process, a road to the day that we're not only justified and sanctified, but one day to be glorified. Amen. He that sanctified and those who are sanctified are one, all out of one source. And he's not ashamed to call the saints his brethren. 
And the Greek word for that means out of the same womb. What a blessing it is when we see our oneness in Christ. And sometimes we just kind of skim over that. We don't get caught up in it. We don't wallow in it. We don't get it all over us. But to realize that we're one with Christ. Well, notice our praise to the Lord. In verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That's a fulfillment of Psalms 22, 22 and 23. I'll declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. <coughs> it's amazing, but it was uttered on the cross by the Lord himself. And the Amplified text expounds to say, in the midst of the worshiping congregation, I will sing hymns of praise to you. In the midst of the worshiping congregation. Boy, the question came to me, are we a worshiping church? I mean, I want to be a worshiping believer. I know Dave not only wants to be a worshiping believer, but wants us to be a worshiping church. <clears throat> but do you want to be a worshiping congregation? What do you suppose that that entails? <clears throat> to say, well, I've come to the house of worship, but what does it entail? As much as I love Brother Dave, uh, be real honest with you, it doesn't begin with him. Amen. Nor does it begin with the instrumentalists or even the dedicated praise team. And is it sure the world doesn't begin with me? Worship is the sound of a soul that's been set free. <coughs> a soul that's been set free. In other words, once I was lost, now I'm found, and my soul has been set free. Now I can worship. Now I can praise Him. Now I have something to praise Him for, to worship Him for. It begins in my heart, and it begins in your heart. It begins when the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm amazed how many of the songs, the hymns that we sing, that we get it here, but sometimes we don't get it here. We sing that little chorus about the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, and we really get into it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So? And, and, and we get caught up in it. But it's a whole hymn. Oh, that the church would arise. Oh, that we would see with Jesus' eyes. We would show the world heaven. Show what it means to be his, to be formed in his likeness. Show them to have a purpose. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Praise the Lord. In the midst of the worshiping congregation, I will sing praise unto thee. <coughs> I'm not a musician. I look up here and I see one old boy's got two guitars. <laughs> Another one's got two saxophones. I ain't got but one comb with cellophane. That's all <laughs> I got. But, but I love being around them. And, they, and they've got a language really all their own. Uh, what part do you sing? Tenor? Soprano? I thought that was a television show, but never. Uh, soprano? Alto? Baritone? Bass? You know, all those little notes and squigglies... They, they mean something, I know, to musicians. But let me tell you something. 
If your heart is not in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, all the notes and the parts and the squigglies mean absolutely nothing. It begins right here. In our hearts singing praises to the Lord. You know, it just dawned on me. When we pray, the Bible says that we're to enter into our closet and shut the door and so on and so forth. That's not just a physical thing, that's a spiritual thing. In other words, when I pray, I'm to shut out y'all. I'm not praying to y'all. And I don't care how it sounds to you. I'm talking to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I'm praying to him and to shut everything and everybody out. Well, let me tell you something. The same thing's true about singing. If I'm off note, you know... You don't have to correct me afterwards. <laughs> you know, I'm not that, I want to hear Jesus say, you know. Uh, I, I never forget when I was in evangelism, I was in this, this church in, outside of Wichita Falls, Bellevue. And there's an old boy, he just loved me, and he'd stick his head under my arm and sing for the glory of God, and it was a little unnerving and embarrassing and, and I mean he was singing loud he was really getting into it and I was singing right along until I realized I was on the wrong verse I couldn't even tell where I was at you know and, and he was but we were both appraising the Lord well what part do you sing I sing loud I want to make a joyful noise, at least joyful to the one whom I'm praising and to I'm glorifying. And to trust in the Lord. Verse 13, again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. I will put my trust in him. Part of what's wrong even in Christendom, is we put our trust in the preacher. Or we put our trust in the church. And when somebody in the church disappoints us, then we're devastated. The scripture says, I'll put my trust in him. And in him alone. Well, refers back to Isaiah 8. And the prophets warning the children of Israel of the danger in trusting in any other help than help that comes from him. War was upon them. Assyria would spoil Damascus and Samaria. But in the midst of the invasion, God would still be with his people. There was a unity between Isaiah and his children. And it was a reminder of the bond between God and his children. How many times have we seen God's faithfulness to Israel against all odds? And let me tell you something. If you're not a supporter of Israel, shame on you. Because God says, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curses thee. Does that mean that they are right, that they make every right decision? No, it does not. But we have a command from the Lord to support them, and God help us when we don't. Well, years ago, I bought a T-shirt in Israel. Had the Star of David on it. And underneath it was the caption, The Original Lone Star State. Texans, we're pretty proud of being the Lone Star State. Well, this was the original Lone Star State. This reference in Isaiah reminds us of the unity between Christ and believers, or Christ and his bride, the church. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. My trust in him. Now, I wanted to run a reference on trust. Again, I was overwhelmed by the volumes, the volumes of verses that encourages us to put our trust in the Lord. 
2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us, it's the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Isn't it a sweet peace when we rest in him? I wish I'd have learned a long time ago, J.K., to let the Lord fight my battles. I didn't want to bother him, and I'd say, well, take care of these, and I'll just duke it out in the alley or whatever. But what a blessing it is when we let the Lord fight our battles and realize greater are they that be for us than they that be against us. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Isaiah 31, 1 Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because there are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. That we trust in all of these outward things rather than trust in the Holy God. I will put my trust in the Lord. There's an old story, but it was a story about a guy that made a living crossing Niagara Falls, pushing a wheelbarrow. And he said, do you believe I can cross Niagara Falls on this wheelbarrow? Yes, I do. I've seen you do it. Do you really trust that I can make it? Yes, I, I trust that you can make it. Okay, climb in this wheelbarrow. There's a difference between me intellectually agreeing with something and me willing to put my Amen. self on the line. It's like the chicken and the pig were trying to raise money for the church. And the chicken said, I, I got an idea. Why don't we just have a ham and eggs breakfast? <laughs> and the pig said, for you, that's a love offering. For me, that's total commitment. <laughs> Are we willing to climb up in the wheelbarrow with the Lord Jesus Christ? When the storms of life are just beating down on us, are we willing to just crawl in the boat with Jesus, curl up next to him, let whatever happens, happen? Well, I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And then destroying the destroyer. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is, the devil. Now this is a strong passage showing that Jesus was very God and very man. And the children here refers to believers. Portakers means to have a share in common with someone else. Likewise means alongside and nearby that Jesus took his place alongside and nearby us. And then took part of, it means to hold with. He who knew no sin literally actually became sin for me. The reason why the Lord Jesus Christ became incarnate in the flesh is that he might die. He needed to die. He needed to raise himself out from under death so that he might break the power of death and thus break the power of the one 
who has the power of death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is that victory, thy victory? We have that in Christ Jesus. Destroy here now, destroying the destroyer, means to bring to naught or to render inoperative. Satan wasn't annihilated at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan did not die. But his power was broken. His power over death and hell and the grave was broken. You know, spiritual death can't hold the person who puts his faith in Christ. Physical death can't keep the believer in the grave. Martha Hart used to sing an old song that says, Ain't no grave gonna hold this body down. I like that. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna come right out of the ground because there ain't no grave gonna hold this body down. He came to destroy the destroyer. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Now notice this deliverance, that he has come and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The Lord through his death made possible for the believing sinner to be released from the grip of fear that death had over him. And now we can sing songs. And again, not just sing them, but incorporate them. I don't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died for my sins to atone. And when the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. I don't have to cross Jordan alone. I had a friend in this church who had a real fear of dying. And he was a believer. And as his death grew near, he told me, he said, Butch, I want you to know I'm no longer afraid of dying. And what a precious word that was to me. A professor at Criswell once said to all the students, how many of you young men have dying grace? And boy, they just shot up their hand. He said, none of you do. You won't have it till you need it. And when you need it, he'll give it to you. Dying grace. No fear of death. Well, much of our fear comes because we fail to study God's word. Because the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. Faith in Christ puts the devil on the run. I love it. Because we have a faithful high priest. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. That reconciliation is a big word, isn't it? Man was created in the image of God. 
And man, because of sin, fell. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ came to reconcile us back to God the Father. Job says, in frustration, he said, if there was just a daysman, in other words, somebody that could get a hold of God and somebody who could get a hold of fallen man and bring us back together. That was a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's come, to lift us up out of the muck and the mire, mire lift us up and has the hand of God and brings us together, reconciled, brought back to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have experienced this, in other words, if you have been saved, then you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we're here for, is to bring in fallen men and women and boys and girls back to God the Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reconciled. Well, there's a lot of people who've been hurt or disappointed by priest and preacher alike. And I don't deny that, but the flip side of that is if you have, you should have been looking higher. Okay. Preachers can and will disappoint you. They put on their pants one leg at a time. And what we want to do is to point you to Jesus, the great high priest, because he will never disappoint you. And what we need to do is to lift people's sights. Boy, I've got a story about that one, but I'm going to leave it here because... You ever been shot at? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but we want to lift people's sights. Let me just say that. One of my favorite passages is about John the baptizer. He was such a powerful prophet. And he had quite the following. But it's so interesting that he narrowed it down, this big following, he narrowed it down to two people, and then he sent them to follow Jesus. It wasn't about him, never was. It was always about Jesus. Well, Paul writes Timothy, and he says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Thank the Lord for his consistency. I mean, we're all over the map, aren't we? I mean, we're up, we're down, we're all around, and uh, we're like a kid with a double dose of Snickers or something. I mean, just off the chart. And yet, the Lord is so consistent and so faithful. Verse 18 says, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he's able to succor them that are tempted. You know, the Bible says that Jesus, in all ways, he was tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Since the beginning, Satan has tempted us with the lusts of the eyes, the lusts of the flesh, and the pride of life. And guess what? He hadn't changed his game plan. When our kids were growing up, they went to East Central High School, and we had a coach one year in football. He had a play that they'd run it up the middle. And the next play, they'd run it up the middle. And the next play, they'd, you got it. Run it up the middle. Because even as ignorant as these other teams were, 
They were smart enough to know they're going to run it up the middle. <laughs> and until they change that mentality and that attitude, did they begin to score. Well, let me tell you something. The devil's using the same old game plan that he's always used. Run it up the middle. Run it up the middle. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what he operates with. But guess what? He did the same thing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. On the Mount of Temptation, he hit him with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And every time he was hit, the Lord responded with Scripture. Amen. And the Scripture will take away the power of the destroyer. Amen. Jesus scripturally says that he's identified with you and with me. The God of all glory, King of creation, has identified with us. Let me ask you a serious question. Are you willing to identify with him? It's one thing to praise the Lord for him identifying with us, but are you willing to identify with him openly, publicly, without shame, saying, yes, I, I want to be saved. I've had a religion, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I want to know without a shot of a doubt that I'm saved. Do you know that you can know? I didn't think you could. I thought we'd wait till the end of time and God rolled the dice and we'd see whether we made it or not. But I'm so thankful that somebody shared with me the word. This, this is the record. This is the authority that God's given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. If I got a chance to talk to every one of you going out, that question would be, do you know without a shadow of a doubt if you were to die today that you'd be with the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, that's not a hope so, maybe so, could be so. It's a no so. Amen. The Bible says that we can know that we know that we know. What I don't understand is why you wouldn't settle it today. Why you wouldn't settle it today. You know, the Bible says all have sinned and become short of the glory of God, all means me, all means all the other preachers that we got in the house, all means all. And the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. It says the wages of sin is death, but I got good news for you. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can come into this thing lost as a goose in a hillstorm. And you can leave as saved and flying as high as an eagle. Bow the knees of your heart and agree with God. Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I want you to save me. And we'll pray together. And you can know. We can share with you in the scripture. You can know that you know, that you know, that you're saved. But you can't, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. You ought to have a desire to follow him in baptism. You ought not to have to send out 52 cards saying, would you please, pretty please, those of you who've been saved, follow him in baptism. You ought to want to. You ought to be like the Ethiopian, what keeps me from being saved? Buddy, you better have a good excuse and not be ashamed to identify with him. Maybe you're saved and identified, but you don't have a church home. 
If God's speaking to you about coming here, we want you to know that you're welcome. But we want you to be in the center of God's will when you do it. We'll meet you at the front. Let's stand and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we know that you're here. That we're, we know that you want to bring many children to glory. Father, we know that right now, that while the Holy Spirit works, there's another force that's working, and that's the old devil himself, and he'll try to distract people from turning loose and coming to Christ. And Lord, I pray that through the blood of the Lord Jesus that you'd cast that destroyer out of this building. Yes. That your Holy Spirit has freedom, access to every heart, beginning with my own. And Father, people would say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed I'm coming today. And we ask it in Jesus' name.